Hi guys and welcome to part three of the CSL replica build. Now as you can see from the other video, the body kit is all on, so on the exterior, really happy with the car. We've also had the rolling road done with the carbon intake. So if you want to see any other bits, obviously check out the videos on the channel. It's really starting to come together and hopefully by the end of the summer, everything will be finished. So today's video is a little bit different. It's not a full step-by-step -step guide. It's more to cover the bits I've done to the car because I've put all the bits on really before I take a, a lot of the notes like I have done with the body kit one. And there was a lot of things when I was buying my M3 that I just didn't understand. People were coming out with phrases and do this, do that, solid couplers, BBK. I was like, what is all this I'm putting on the car? And why is everyone so keen to get it done? So in this video, as I say, we're taking a bit of a drive over to my friend's house to pick up the new seats. So stay tuned for that video. But today we'll go over the basics of what I've learned and hopefully got it right. Cause I don't want to be giving you guys wrong information. So the first big upgrade I did to the M3 was about a year and a half ago, and it was with the brake kit. Now I went with the K-Sport 8-pot kit, including Paget RS29 pads, which are absolutely stunning. Now, I can't say I've had any fade on the road, whereas I managed to warp the original discs um, on a back road blast, unfortunately. So they needed changing, and rather than just replace, I knew I was going to drive it as hard again, so I wanted to upgrade it, and that's when I went ahead with the K-Sport kit. Now, I'll put all the links in the description of where I picked the parts up. Um, so if you guys obviously can find a better deal, great. But for me, they worked out the best price. And it's really important, especially with the brake pads, to upgrade them over the standard K-Sport ones. Because I've read a lot that the K-Sport pads are no better than the originals. But treat the kit to the RS29s and they are absolutely gorgeous. As you can hear, we've just come to a stop. No brake squeal. Even from cold, the bike's really good. Um, but the only thing that is a bit of a drawback, it's not a big problem to keep the car pretty clean is they are quite dusty. They do make a lot of brake dust when you're on the brakes. But other than that, really impressive them, completely changes the pedal feel. I haven't had any need to upgrade the uh, ABS system at all. It doesn't feel like it requires it. I haven't done the rears, completely standard on the rear and it drives absolutely fine. And so I haven't taken it on track. So we may find the weak link then, especially as I've obviously got rid of the brake cooling ducts to put the CSL bumper on. So the other upgrade I've done, especially to the suspension side of things, is the IVAC springs. Now I think these were about 180, 200 pounds for the set, and I'm running the standard dampers. They're a big improvement over the standard, especially on the ride height, because mine sat really high at the front, which didn't look particularly great, and it was always bugging me every time I'd washed it or stood back from the car. So it made a big difference having those put on. The ride doesn't seem much different, maybe a little bit crashier, but there was still a big weak link with the uh, body roll which I hope the springs was going to get rid of so what I did was I left it for a couple of months because it wasn't something that was on the top of the list but I eventually which is fit to the car now went with the Turner Motorsport anti-roll bar kit which comes with the front and rear anti-roll bar you get the uprated polyurethane bushes and you also get new bolts to go on the back because it's a slightly different design on the rear drop link so I think they're about 480 pound from the set and I got those from mirrorjohn.com he does the rear view mirror which again will be a video we go over on the interior as to what caused all this mess down here unfortunately so fitting the rear and front and roll bars not a big job I'd say the front was the easiest literally case to jack it up remove the sump shield a couple of bolts drop links off in and out the rear is where it gets a little bit more interesting I thought that one would be the easier one because you had all the access you have to get it up quite high in the air so that you can take the actual old anti-roll bar out and it's the old drop links that are the pain in the arse to get off and when I say pain in the arse I mean skin removing on the rear wishbone the best way to do it I found was to jack the car up take the rear wheels off and then you can get access to the drop links off of the wishbone and drop them out that way now when I put the anti-roll bars on I didn't realize that you can't really use the old drop links well you can but you've got to press them out and I thought by the time I've done that wrecked the bush destroyed it trying to get it out I might as well just buy a new set I think it's about 45 pounds so not ridiculous money and then if I ever did turn the car back to standard as I've said before it's a very important thing the car has no permanent modifications to keep the retail value in it if for some unknown reason I needed to sell the car for financial reasons you can always just switch it back so other than the drop links not a bad job and the improvement change was instant the moment i put the kit on and went out on the road i was like oh, i've spent the money well here because it's a real weak link on the e46s especially body i mean now the car is just darting and that's just with the eye bands on it so i look forward at a later date to go with some coilovers there's a lot of choice out there with everything you get what you pay for i would love to put a set of olins on it or a nitron kit i've seen those but I just don't think I can justify two and a half, three thousand pounds on a coilover kit on a car I do two thousand miles a year in. So the KWs are another option, the Bill Scenes are another option, 
but I say it's trying to get out in a car with them and see what sort of differences I'm going to see without spending an absolute fortune. And you also got to bear in mind that the rear top mounts can be uprated, the top mounts on the front can be uprated and become fully adjustable so you can change things like your camber, your caster. Um, again, something I'll go into more if I do do the kit and give you guys a bit more of a detail on it. I'm not a suspension guru, I don't pretend to be, I've just picked up stuff over the years doing my track days and the Renault Sports and the bikes and to be honest with you, it's one of the biggest improvements you can make to a vehicle over braking. So many people get caught up in this sort of power hungry, I want it to be up 200, 300, 400 horsepower, I've seen it through the hot hatch scene and you get someone with a good chassis and brakes running 20-30% less power and they'll walk all over you because you'll be hurling down the straights, brake fading at the end of it, absolute waste of time. Power for me is something you do for the enjoyment, obviously lap times if you're, if you're here setting world records, but if you're a general track day goer, brakes and suspension all day long are gonna be the biggest satisfaction you'll get for the day. So the other big sort of taboo talk on the M3 forums that you read about is the dreaded boot floor. Now, I ended up going to ETO Motorsport down there, the guys dropped the uh, rear diff carrier and everything out, put the plates on, welded it all up, sealed it all, and put it all back together. And they did a few upgrades to the car while it's in there. I had the upright diff bolts, and what happens with the upright diff bolts, if you've heard about them, is the original design has got some sort of, um, I think it's a taper on the bolt that's a bit shy of, uh, bolt into the diff housing and what happens is, is you get movement so when you go from say forward to reverse you get a clunk and it wasn't something that bothered me in particular because the SMG is a clunky box anyway so just sort of accepted that it's an old car but you know what putting those in has got rid of that so I still get a bit of noise obviously as I say it's an old car but it's really improved it compared to the old one and while it was a part the guys at ETA Motorsport said look your rear trailing arm bushes are absolutely shot your prop donut is shot just an old car so while that was a part we got all that done and had the inspection too done and for those who watch the channel you can probably see I'm quite hands-on but with things where you don't know what you're doing or you haven't done it before and also things like not having the shims in stock to figure just drop it off to somebody who knows what they're doing they've got a welder if anyone's ever seen any of my previous welding work I'll try and find a picture they say in pigeon poo so I need a bit of practice before I can class myself as a welder that I would be happy with on the car but with that all done we should be safe now at least for another 80,000 miles. There is also talk, typically as I've had mine done, of a V-brace which runs inside the boot lining and this links the chassis rails together to the diff housing from what I can read and I've only looked into it briefly and it's meant to improve the whole rear end rigidness of the car and also stop those dreaded cracks again. But as I've said, the car's done 83,000 miles before it went in, the guys at ETA said there was a few splits, a few pop welds, but nothing too serious. It's seen a lot worse. So. I'm not going to cover another 80,000 miles in this car. It should never be a problem, at least for the next 10, 15 years for me. So fingers crossed, that's all sorted. And uh, like I say, can just enjoy driving it. So the other aspect, which I covered in the last video, because it sort of is cosmetic as well as a handling improvement, is I've got the CM wheels, replica CSL wheels on here. And I've also run in their 12 mil spacer kit, which just brings the car into the arches now. The CSL wheels have a slightly wider offset than the uh, normal wheels. So if you're gonna run spacers with the CSL wheels, uh, CSL wheels, sorry, I run 12 mil all round, which I found absolutely perfect. I get no rubbing, and that's the last thing you want because these cars are prone to rusting on the rear arches. So if you start going over speed bumps, wiping paint off the arch liners and you get rust in there, it's gonna be an expensive day out. It's just not worth it. So if you do wanna run bigger spaces, Without the rubbing, obviously you can have your arches rolled further. Again, potential risk to crack the paint and cause problems long term with that. And you can also put more camber in. Now, if you look at your wheels on the side of the car, the more camber you put in, the more it brings the top of the wheel in, which can improve handling, but in a high powered rear wheel drive car, you potentially lose straight line traction. So you can add a little bit if you're getting some rubbing issues, obviously, but for me, 12 mil looks great. It sits perfectly on the car and I'm really happy with it. I wouldn't want to put any more in there and risk that. And same with the ride height, you just, dealing with cars that you can't use anymore because you've modified them to a length to stance or scene points it it's just not worth it for me so oh good old SMG clunk still warming it up well actually saying that is up to temperature 90 degrees in the oil but everything else I'm really fussy with that things like the diff in the back are still going to need time obviously to get temperature in them
trailer pulling out, that's never a good sign. So, as I said, now the wheel's being done, tyres done, I mentioned the camber. Now, there is obviously a few settings you can do to the standard car on these because you've got fixed top mounts. And I say it's fixed, which isn't technically true because there is a little trick that I learned through the forums again is that when the car goes in for geo, you can actually undo the strut brace, undo the top mounts, and push the top of the dampers in and lock it all back up again. And this will give you around half a degree more camber over standard. So nice little tip if you are running the standard top mounts and you obviously don't want to have to go down the harsh reality of fitting the uprated ones for two, 300 pounds that are going to make the car a little bit crashy. So you can dial in a little bit more camber that way. Um, but other than that, it's only a normal sort of uh, camber and toe adjustments front and rear so when the car does go in for geo you can ask for the csl settings now most tire alignment places when they put in m3 it will say standard m3 or it will say m3 csl now i've gone with the csl settings i can't actually remember what the difference was i think it was just a slightly different aggression on the front toe but don't quote me on it but i thought while it's in there there's no additional cost it's obviously just what they use for the alignment side of things before get it in get it done because when i had the boot floor done all of the rear was dropped out there's every chance that it could move out the alignment on the rear and i hadn't had the front done in a while so i thought while it's there get it all done properly and then it's ready and hopefully won't destroy the tires so onto tires again something i've seen over the years where people just overlook something so crucial it's the only point that holds you to the road so if you're going to spend your money brakes and tires again worth every penny so on this i went with the michelin super sports and i had on it before a mixture of dunlop and handcuffs and what i discovered was is when i fit the big brake kit the tires were just no longer up to the challenge you'd push really hard and you could feel the abs kick back where they were just braking on traction especially with the handcuffs the Dunlops, they were okay, but they were getting to the end of their life, so I thought, you know what, it's time to get them upgraded. Went with the all-round uh, CSL sizes, which I think was 265, 30, 19 on the rear, and 235, 35, 19 on the front. And what was really annoying when I fitted these, is I bought them, fitted them, and two weeks later, all this word of the, uh, the four S's came out, the new Michelins, that are meant to be better than the Super Sports, better whip, grip, better ride, just destroy them on every level. And I thought, I've just fitted these things. I'm gonna have to at least two or three years use out of them. But that said, they're a great tire, and compared to what I had on there before, massive difference. So the car at this point now, really starting to come together it felt really tight again a little bit crashy for road use with the IMAX and the standard dampers not horrific I've driven modified cars in the past but I do fancy something that I could maybe soften off a little bit but still have the road hole now with the anti-roll bar cue. so moving on from the tyres and the wheels you've then got the steering brand now this was a bit of a strange one to me because in my eyes the m car should have the best parts it should have the best brakes it should have the best steering rack should have the best tires wheels blah 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 out of the factory but something i noticed when i was driving my e46 320d is the e46 seemed just a little bit keener on the 320d to turn in and i thought nah this has got to be in my head it's got to be something to do with the wider tires on this this just doesn't add up because my m3 should outhandle this all day long they're the same year um, and then that's when I discovered something called the purple tag. Now essentially what these tags mean are the steering racks on the car. Now I've tried to look in more to why BMW fitted a green tag which is what's fitted to the M3 as standard. Now what the green tag is, it is lock to lock, it's three and a half turns and then the purple tag lock to lock is three turns and then don't quote me on this but I think it's the blue tag that's in the CSL and the Z4M if you haven't seen the video I've obviously reviewed that has 2.7 turns lock to lock now purple tag racks were fitted to the e46 m sport models so your 320ds 330ds i believe are through through 30 petrols and bits and bobs like that so you can pick them up from anywhere from 50 to 100 pounds there are places that offer to do them rebuilt on an exchange basis but one place i spoke to he said yeah 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 fit your car mate fit your car i said well is it a purple tag he goes i don't know we took all the tags off and we refurb them so forth I'm not going to risk it, I'll just go and buy a used purple tag and if it is leaky then obviously I can get that rebuilt and sent away because I don't use the car every day so I've got the luxury that it can be off the road for a week at a time. 
So I picked up a, the, so the purple tag rack, which I think I paid about £65 plus a bit of postage from a breaker. The guy said he put six months warranty on it, it doesn't leak, but I thought the £65 isn't the problem, it's the ball laker fitting it and removing it if it is leaking. Oh, that's with my junction. Anyway, so where were we? The um, rack, like I say, I bought the rack, got it sent in, thought, yeah, great, lovely. And then I read a lot of things about people saying, yeah, purple tag, solid coupler. And I was like, what on earth are they going on about now? It just looks like a normal rack to me. What solid coupler have I got to take it apart? And that's when I did a bit more research. And the solid coupler runs between the steering column and the steering rack. And it's essentially like a rubber donor that just helps any sort of shock load coming back through. But obviously like all things, rubber perishes and over time you can end up with sort of play between that rubber donut in the column and the uh, steering rack. So I thought, well, I might as well get this done as well while we're in here. It's just something I picked up off of eBay. It was only about 15, 20 pounds delivered and it come with the bolts. And you know what? I got the guys at ETA do it. I thought it's on the ramp. They're doing the inspection too. Yes, I'm going to be lazy and pay someone to do the ramp and the coupler. And the guys got it all done. And straight away from leaving there, I could feel a massive improvement. And what I discovered with the M3 is I felt like I had like a bit of dead play at 12 o'clock. And it wasn't terrible, but it certainly made you a little bit uneasy if you're pressing on on a country road and the car was finding itself. You could find this sort of float that just, it just didn't fill me with confidence. But again, I was enjoying the car didn't let it bug me too much because it was not what you're being in the M3 but that has completely gone whether it was the coupler or the steering rack I don't know and again only looking on the internet I read some parts on there and I tried to find out why BMW had fitted this green tag rack and the only thing that came back on one forum and whether it's true or not I don't know is the guy said look the problem with the M3 it was it was built to be in Germany it was going to do 155 mile an hour imagine doing 155 mile an hour on the autobahn with a rack that was super sensitive. You'd end up killing yourself. So that argument was put forward that if you had that close ratio rack, whereas the obviously the non-M3 cars would be doing 130, 140, they're not gonna see that sort of speed. But with the close ratio rack and the solid coupler, in theory, the car could be a lot more twitchier at high speed. It's not something I've noticed, but obviously BMW sold a car to sell all around the world. So the last thing they wanna do is have people crashing them at 155 mile an hour on the speed limiter. So with that all done, again, massive improvement, but as you can probably see from this video, there was lots of little things that really started bringing this car together. And it was a fabulous car in standard form. I love driving it, but driving it now is absolutely superb. It just feels so dialed in and so on point. The tires, the brakes, the anti-roll bars, the suspension. And I think the big thing now that's starting to let it down, the seats. Now, my missus loves these, she can't understand, she loves the heating element, she loves the old hugging bolster, but I don't feel stupidly high, but I just don't feel massively supported, I just feel there's nothing really on the base, and I find I use my left leg against the centre console, and my right leg almost sort of like wedged on the door, which isn't a great driving position, and thankfully I haven't got a clutch to worry about, obviously with my cheating auto. Um, so, with that in mind, I thought I'm going to get some seats, but again, this is one of those things we'll go over in the next video because I'm sure it'll be a full install because I'm actually going to remember to have the camera on me. So I thought for you guys, I'm going to do a full run through on getting these fitted, what's involved and with the occupancy sensor and all that that I've been looking into. So anyway, back on track, back to the handling. So I guess another thing to talk about with the handling is the CSL red match and I've gone over it in the first video and it does make a massive difference. Now we're on a nice little twisty bit of road, downshift, you can hear it blip and the car is just on point. CSL rev matching software coming up and down the box is just an absolute pleasure and again it's something I'll go over in another video because I don't think I want to 
all year we've talking forever about it, but there have been so many people that have said to me, oh, unlucky mate, bought the SMG. I was like, no, I wanted to buy the SMG. Oh, they're rubbish, they're shit, should have bought manual. And I don't understand this because fair enough, if you're a purist, go and buy a Honda S2000. I think it's one of the best manual gearboxes I've ever driven in. Absolute perfection on a gearbox. Mark II MX-5, have our nose feel a little bit. Again, lovely mechanical feeling gearbox. Feels really on point. But the BMW, although it does make a good manual gearbox, it's just that, it's good. It's not exciting, it's not enjoyable, it's not particularly nice to drive with. And it's not just mine, I've driven countless ones. And I've even driven with them in the 1M and in the M3. And it just does nothing for me at all. It's long geared, it doesn't excite me running down through the box. I don't get that sort of nice roaring mechanical feeling. So I actually love the SMG, but again, I won't you know, go on the bandwagon about how amazing I think it is. But if you have an SMG with a standard software, it is bad. I think that's where it's received a lot of hate from people because it does this weird thing where you shift down, it sort of holds and then it lurches a little bit forward, but not a rev mat. It just, it's just horrible. I don't know what they were thinking when they put that on there, but thankfully some clever clogs managed to work out how to copy the CSL software and get us the privilege of having that in our uh, SMG normal m and It does make a massive difference, it really does make a big difference to the car and I actually enjoy driving it. And yes, it isn't smooth, it is old technology, so if you're looking for something you can get in every day and just forget about it like the DCTs or the DSGs or the PDKs even in the Porsche that I've driven, they're absolutely incredible. But there is something really fun about this. Not so good when you're around town, but when you're on point and you feel that shud. Like if you drive a DSG, you don't get that. If you drive an E92 DCT, you get a little bit of it. If you drive an F80 M3, again, it just gets a little bit more refined that you lose that beautiful, brutal, almost like flat shift feeling. And you know, if anyone says to you, oh, you've got old single clutch technology, just tell them this. The Aventador's been fitted with it. Can you beat one of them? Probably not exactly the same technology, but I will tell people that because I do love my little SMG single clutch. Although you probably will watch a video later when the pump fails and I'll be sat at the side of the road or probably in the Alps trip throwing my toys out the pram. But anyway, hopefully that clears up a lot of the modification stuff for you guys.